and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, sneak enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a I have one returning good brother and one newcomer into the temple. They are part of the triple-headed monster that is the writing team for the upcoming Conan the Hyborian Age. Monolith's attempt at doing Conan in TTRPG form, taking on that legacy. In the red corner, we have our we have our returning good brother. Some of you may know who, through the Gaia Project, Chris Shepperson, aka Shep. And in the blue corner. We have the rules development guy for for the Hyborian Age, Matthew John. How you doing? How you doing today, guys? Or tonight, in the case of one of you. Yeah, well, how yeah, are you doing should... there, Shep? Okay, me. Yeah, I'm all right. Okay, good. I mean, it's later for you. This is weird. We're in a we're in a warp of sorts. Uh, yeah, I'm great, man. Thank you for having us. Uh, this project has been a labor of love. One of those things, uh, you know, I sort of earned the right to do. I also feel blessed and privileged to uh, have been given the keys to this uh, kingdom of Aquilonia, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to to dish about uh, really our, our approach here and um, and what folks can expect from this iteration of our favorite Sumerian. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I do have to go through one of my, go through one of my traditions that I do with every newcomer. I've already done this with you, with you, Shep, the first time I had you on. Um, one of the traditions here, here, aside from the drinking, is going into the humble beginnings, mm. the origin story. So, Matt, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Okay. So, role-playing games for me, they go back to um, D&D, uh, AD&D, uh, second edition. I was probably in grade five or grade six, and my older brother's friends uh, kind of grouped up with my uncle, who ran them through this. Um, the older kids, you know, they thought it was cool, but to me, I was like, Oh my God! What is this that I am being invited to? Um, I mean, I even—I <laughs> remember I got stuck with playing the cleric because we needed the ambulance, um, and I didn't care, right? I was like, "I'll do it, and I will, I will, I will, I will serve all of these older people who are uh, good enough to have me here." So I kind of kept my head down, shut up, and uh, leafed through those books and took in all of the, you know, the Larry Elmore and the Jeff Easley and the Clyde Caldwell. And that sort of artwork that just blew my mind as a kid and, you know, turned the forests around my house into fantasy landscapes. Um, and, you know, from there, I, I, I collected miniatures on those old blisters, terrible painter of them. Um, and then when my group of friends really started to try to do it on our own in grade six and grade seven, uh, I ended up being the GM who sort of came up with all of his own mythology and, you know, the same thing that every creative type uh, will say. And so, that was the big one, right? AD&D, Second Ed, Thacko. Um, and really, if you know Thacko, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a bragging right, I think, um, to say you survived that. Um, <laughs> which, I don't know. It's perhaps not the worst mechanic ever, but it has a rep, right? Um... So from there, you know, I, we played all kinds of different ones. D6 Star Wars, we played uh, a lot of... We went to Savage Worlds, you know. Uh, just over the years, we mostly stuck with vanilla D&D, &D, um, which eventually brought me here to where I never play vanilla D&D <laughs> &D anymore, and I'm trying different things, so... Yeah. Yeah, man, it was just a, It was an imagination boost, and it got me on to my writing career, and then, of course, uh, you know, fortunate enough to land uh, game design gigs, and... Conan is my favorite fictional character, so hell yeah, man. What can I say? Yeah. Now, when you said you started with AD and D, was it first or second? It was second. Like it, it was somewhat of a mix. I remember I had um, both books were in circulation, but really it came down to um, 
yeah, the second ed with the classic player's handbook and yeah. Hmm. Not the, like the, I, I honestly don't even know the differences between the two. I just remember leafing through looking at those, uh, the first edition of AD and D and being like, Oh, that seems a little different. And then <laughs> we just kind of ignored those books and looked at them because they were cool. I can say one of the big differences in, fir in first and second. And I, I have word of God on this because years ago I interviewed the late J um, James Ward on the matter. Is mm -hmm. first edition was writing at a college level, um, second edition was writing at a high school level. Um, wow, interesting. And the ma the main reason for that was j was just shifting the writing to be more um, accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, since. D and D had its roots in those college in those college wargaming circles, but yeah, I guess they yeah. didn't they didn't want to be limited to just that. Uh, no, I mean is, accessibility is very important. <laughs> yeah, which given given certain people who want want to um, talk all the smoke about about how um, about how second edition is this more refined experience or whatever claptrap um, that crowd uses is. Um, uh -huh. Ironic in hindsight. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've, but I, but um. The and it, when it comes to Thaco, the the attitude that I've always had is, Thaco is an all right mechanic that's just poorly explained. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and I think I think that. That's the bane of a lot of little uh, system quirks over the years, too, right? Like, the bones of it are good, the idea is good, it's just, if you can't easily grasp it, it's just a disservice, right? Well, that and, um, you'll notice over the years, you see less and less games that try and do this high-low thing where some roles you're trying to aim high, some roles you're trying to aim low. Oh. Yeah. With the, with the wargaming scene, there is a lot of... Um, separate sub mechanics instead of a unified whole. You could argue you still have mm -hmm. some of that to an extent in uh, modern wargaming, but nowhere near as it w as it was back in the day. And as time went on, you started to have an all roads lead to Rome kind of philosophy of a unifying mechanic that is altered through context. Uh, mm -hmm. What Bungie would refer to as the thirty seconds of fun. Even if people have misinterpreted that over the years, but I digress. <laughs> so, shifting from that, Conan has taken a lot of incarnations, not just in role-playing games. Obviously, there's been the film, there's been the cartoon, which everybody conveniently tries to forget about, but I refuse to let them. There's been the numerous... Agreed. I love it. <laughs> there's been the numerous incarnations <laughs> of the comic books, um... There was the other movie, which got way more hate than it deserved. Um, what was your guys' in in introduction to Conan as a character? And the world of Robert E. Howard as a whole? Chime in, Shep. It's your turn. Well, I, my... I mean, my first introduction to Conan was Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, like, my 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 dad was a big fan of Arnie movies when I was a kid, and uh, I just remember, you know, when I was probably a bit too young to be watching them, you know, seeing things like Terminator and Commando and uh, Turtle Recall, and you know, Conan was on that playlist, and um, so yeah, my my first introduction to the character was, if you like, the uh, inaccurate version of Conan. The, um, was portrayed on the on the big screen as much as i love it you know it, it's um you know it's a it's a bit of a a step from howard's um you know fictional uh writing but uh, you know i i just i loved it i was i was hooked the first time i saw the first movie you know i guess they watch it now and it's just cheesy as hell but it's just got <laughs> something about it that you know i don't know if it's just nostalgia there's just something that makes you feel warm inside, you know. It's just it's just a great thing. And from from there, when I when I um, when I when I got a little older, in my later teens, I started reading a lot more fantasy, and I um, 
you know, I picked up uh, some of the fiction and, um, you know, and it, and it changed my, you know, Howard's writing changed my view of fantasy uh, fiction, you know, up yeah. to that point, I'd, I'd, you know, somebody said, tell me about fantasy fiction and you, my, my mind went to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and, and that kind of thing. And then, you know, reading something that's like a really powerful, all engrossing um, fantasy movie where it just feels, it feels, a, the fiction feels adult from the outset. It feels like um, just deeper and darker. And to, it was the first, I think it's probably the first true fantasy setting that are like, that wasn't full of elves and dwarves and orcs that I'd ever read. And that really stood out to me as being like uh, it really different, you know. Like I could relate to the world way more, like far more than I than I thought I could do. And you know, and it went from there. Um, it wasn't too long before I discovered some of the earlier um, RPG offerings when I was, you know, role playing as a, as a, as a teenager, and then. Um, I guess I've read a bunch of the comic books over the years, and then eventually when I um, worked for Modifius as a, a project and line manager, I ended up shepherding the last four or and a half books of the Modifius line, um, you know, over the line for those, like project managing it, that, that line for those. But I, in one way or another, every time I've tried to get away from Conan, he's found a way to uh, catch me. <laughs> And bring me back in again. Uh, so yeah, but it all started with the movies. It all started with the uh, with the movies, which now I've spoke about. I feel driven to go and watch again this evening on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I just got two uh, two new versions, just deluxe 4K. I think they're Arrow release or something. They're called. And uh, yeah, I'm due for some rewatches. I mean, it's pretty annual. For me to be watching Conan, um, and like you, my um, sorry, my dog is upstairs, click clacking above me. I don't know. No worries. If you're hearing that, but uh, anyways, I um, yeah, my introduction with Conan was was very young, I and mean, it was around the time that I discovered D and D. I've told this story on my uh, Rogues in the House podcast and other interviews I've done, so apologies to anyone who's heard it before. But for me, it's either the Schwarzenegger films, which would have been the Destroyer first, um, or it is uh, Conan the Barbarian issue 101, where it's it would have been the the comic after uh, Belit's death. Oh, spoiler alert! <laughs> um, but there, it's it's Conan. He's 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 perched atop a log and he's fighting against this Kushite with this spear, and below is this really crazy looking. Uh, hairy spider uh drawn by john Buscema, and uh i mean that locked into my head like almost nothing else and of course the schwarzenegger films and the muscles and the i mean like shep said um it gave an alternate view to fantasy um that made it like i, I don't know fantasy i've said this before too is is the genre i love the most and i hate most of it um, because it's just not, <laughs> if it's whimsical or if it's too bright or if it's, I don't know, I can't, I can't find interest in that. I want more horror in there, which Conan offers. I want some grit, um, and I want it to be fairly rooted in history to the point that it, it, it isn't alien and unfamiliar until you want it to be, you know? Um... So that that was really that was my first look into it, and I mean, He Man, the Hulk, and um, Conan were all the sort of <laughs> visual archetypes that blew the mind of of this young man in the '80s. Yeah. And so beyond that, you know, I I, I encountered the Howard, um, you know, the old Frazetta Lancer paperbacks. Um, then of course, uh, you know, copies of Savage Sword of Conan really struck me when I was in university. And then, you know, read all the Howard, ran my D&D campaigns. Um, and man, eventually I came to write Conan for uh, Monolith. I started working and developing on the board game. Actually, before that, I was at Modifius doing the crossover mm -hmm. book, which was the Conan Monolith source book, where mm -hmm. 
I got to essentially develop the solo co-op system for that, um, which came as a last minute choice, which was just nuts. And I wrote like 20 scenarios for that book, which is insane. I would never do that again. But anyways, it was my foot in the door. And then I worked on a couple other books from Modiphius as well on Conan and uh, continued to develop the board game at Monolith. And then when it came time, they decided they wanted the rights for the RPG. Um, they put me in, coach. So there we go. Yeah. So with the, now with that in mind, since with, since with every, as I mentioned before, it went live, every game is, is someone's first, and that's... Definitely, that's definitely going to be the the uh, case. Before you mm. get, before you guys had stepped onto this project, how f obvious, obviously, with obviously with you, you had with you, man, you had worked at least a little bit with Modiphius, so that answers this mm. question to an extent. But when it comes to the um, Conan RPGs that came before that, did you guys dip into that when developing this? Uh, I, sh I certainly did. Uh, well, actually, that's how I ended up getting my gig with uh, Modiphius at all, was, who I don't know, over 10 years ago now, 12 years ago or so, maybe, uh, I was playing the Conan Mongoose game, so the, the D20 variant, which I think, uh, as far as I've played, is my favorite version of D20. I, I really enjoyed that game. It's a little chunky. It's a little cumbersome at points. Um, it is a which, product you know, that's, of the two thousands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, any, I mean, I loved it because I was totally into Conan and I learned that system well. And I GM'd it for years with different groups. Um, and I created what was called Conan. Well, it was called Conan RPG Players, a group on Facebook originally. Which I then changed to Conan Gaming Group when we had this deluge of Conan games coming through. And so I, I had basically been using that page for that purpose. And then, you know, the creators at uh, Modiphius and Monolith were both in the group. They knew who I was because I was always championing these games. Um, and then I kind of got moved into it there. So my, my experience with Conan on tabletop was predominantly the Mongoose game, which I liked quite a bit. Mm hmm yeah, and I, I remember being surprised when I, when I saw Modiphius do that expansion to cross over some of the Mongoose stuff with uh, what with what was being done with the 2D20 engine. Uh, yeah. Because those sort of those sort of between edition or between game crossovers are something that even to this day are still rare to see. Uh, I feel like they're highly challenging. I would <laughs> I straight up would never offer that as a creator. It just is. I'm not saying it's not something publishers I work with wouldn't. It's that from a personal standpoint, that sounds like an absolute nightmare from a design point of view. Um, not that it can't be done, but to do it well and to do it right. I mean, that's a that's a massive task, in my the, opinion. The most ambitious yeah. incarnation of that that I'm aware of is Fusion, uh, spelled with a Z, mm -hmm. which was this, well, fusion between <laughs> between of elements between the hero system and interlock by our Telsorian games. Yeah. And I, I would also just say, I don't, I don't, sorry. I just, I don't understand the point either where it's like, if it's you like, cause you can mostly use the old modules and apply them to the new system with very little work in terms of, you know, change this combat resolution to that one. Um, and you keep the text and the stories and the beats. So I don't understand why you have to integrate. I don't know. To be honest, it, it kind of blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Now, within the system for the Hyborian Age, uh, mm -hmm. the as I, under, I understand it, you are instead instead of utilizing a particular die size like what's happened before, uh, it is do, it is doing the full range, not too far removed from. Um, Savage Worlds. What made you guys go with with the approach that you did for the core mechanic here? So, with the dice range, I wanted something. So, it's I kind of have to go back to the the main pillar of design here, which was an accessible game that would entice the thousands and thousands of Conan board game players um, that we already have. 
at Monolith, um, I wanted to appeal to those folks, perhaps um, newbies to RPGs, RPG curious folks. Um, and what I wanted was a game that stuck in a lower range of numbers, not something that's going to... Um, something that was more contained as I started working through it. Um, which, with the sort of eye for, well, I'll expand these numbers as needed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the main thing I wanted with the mechanics was just elegance and streamlined. Now, I know that for our, uh, our crunch-heavy players, that's like, you know, disinteresting, and that's, that's totally okay for me. Like, I, I know, but this is... I, I want... I've designed this game for the busy... GM, the one who, you know, if you're going to take on a new system, that's a big choice. So I wanted to make sure it was a system that was somewhat familiar, yet uh, not a total bear to learn. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it something that you could get to the table rather quickly. Um, and it needed to feel similar to our board game, which is one thing I, I hope people will keep in mind. Um, you know, when they assess this game on its merits, it's that we're really, we're not adapting the board game, but we are adapting the vibe and the flow and the sort of, um, the, the uh, kinetic combat. So I guess what I'm saying is I wanted this to be a game where you read the rules and then you can get your nose out of the rule book. It's not a constant look up of things. Um, and I won't lie to you. Some of this is in reaction to the Modifius game. Um, I think that the bones of that game are solid, and I think that it is a game, obviously, that appeals to folks, but it didn't really appeal to me from a system standpoint, as I am not somebody who likes a lot of subsystems. I don't want a simulator um, where, you know, with hit locations, I, I don't want a magic system that is wholly removed from the sort of mechanics... Of, of combat resolution and, and checks and all of these things. So in some ways I made this as a, as a game for those who were really crying for something a little more simple. Um, and I don't mean simple as a pejorative. I mean it in the sense that you don't have to devote tons of your time to learning and running the game. I do that because it's Conan, but also because it's swords and sorcery. And to me, if you have a swords and sorcery game, which has a very specific meaning. It does not just mean fantasy that involves swords and magic. Sword and sorcery is a tradition of storytelling where uh, it's often short stories. It is uh, forward momentum. It is risk versus reward. It is people with mercenary objectives. It is blood and thunder. It is, uh, you know, it is carnage and it is magic that will curl your toes and, you know, threaten to kill you for using it. And so... We needed something in the spirit of that, and to me, that needs to be something that you pick up pretty easily, and then the game gets the hell out of the way so that you can tell the stories. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I realize you asked about dice. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I wanted was, uh, I wanted um, a bit of symmetry as far as checks and stats, right? So that certain things just line up nicely. You know your stat's always this. You roll the dice to add to it. And I wanted the fluctuations to be, uh, sorry, the ranges to be a little more narrow because you're dealing with human beings in this. We don't have elves. We don't, like, we have men and women who get by on the, you know, the whalebone and gristle <laughs> of which they are composed. And so I didn't want something with a crazy swingy range um, or something that is necessarily setting up for epic level campaigns, right? Like Conan, by the end of this, is just Conan, right? He's highly skilled. He can pull things off. We don't know, need to be breaking into D20s to show just how much more powerful he is, right? He still ultimately can fall to an arrow to the heart. Um, and so I, I wanted to keep that stuff reined in. And we really then focused on, okay, the stats are fairly static. They're, they're not. You can, you can adjust those. Um, but I wanted it to be about your skill set. Because Conan, uh, and this is also why we did not do a class system in this. I think a class system in a Conan game is just the opposite of what you should do. Conan has been a buccaneer, a barbarian, a thief, a king. 
I mean, pretty much everything but a bard, right? He's been a, a ranger, a borderer type. Um, I did not want anyone to feel completely locked into, oh, I'm this, so this is what I do. So we made the choices buffet style um, in terms of how you progress. So you're getting new skills. You are able to up your stats. You're able to do different combat maneuvers. You're able to get more actions. Um, and you can, you can really do it how you want, which I was a little influenced um, by Dark Souls and Demon Souls and those games where you kind of have a little starting package, and then from there, you do what you want. You kind of move in the direction that you want. And the only thing we really had to rein in there was sorcery. So if you're going to be a sorceress-type character, you kind of have to decide that day one. Um, because, again, we also don't want min-maxers being like, I am Conan the wizard, right? It's like, we, we had to kind of prevent that as well. Yeah. So, so that's my very long-winded well, answer. <laughs> it's probably worth pointing out, just in relation to that, however, that we've still... We still put a lot of work into making the options of being a sorcerer to be really wide. I mean, you do have to make that yes. decision during character creation, but sorcery in some capacity is available to 50% of the, um, the origin backgrounds in the yeah. game. Yeah. So, exactly. And, and, and those, those origins are like, whilst some of those origins might promote you they might make you feel like okay the way to go with this character is to be a sorcerer of this style they absolutely don't have to be and if you wanted mm -hmm. to build somebody who felt like a barbarian type character out of those uh character origins it's it's absolutely viable it's just the natural yeah. intrinsic bonuses that come from those origins uh, and your effectiveness to use the sorcery will be hampered but, you know, if you want to go down that route, break the mold, and you, you absolutely can. That The beauty of those sorcery-available origins is that you can build a lot of really viable characters out of them and never touch sorcery. It's just yeah, an exactly. option that's there for you at some point. Should your character have a, a suitable story arc that lets them stumble over it, but you want to be a character who is born of the blood of a demon, and have absolutely yeah. no part in demonic ma magic. Maybe you shun the idea that you're from a, a demonic bloodline. That's completely cool. Go, go for it. You know, like the story comes first. Yeah. And it's even worth mentioning too, that like in one of the stories, Conan does a little bit of what could be um, interpreted as sorcery himself, where it's in beyond the black river. He basically sketches out a sign of Jabal Sag, um, which the way we had to kind of approach magic in this game is it's not overly defined in terms of its mechanics, right? Uh, never mind the game, but like the actual world of Howard. Um, so we, we had to kind of interpret that and then make it actually function as a game. I think I would say the thing that I was very careful about in this was to, with, with just our four stats, I was very careful to make sure each one was viable to sort of uh, put your resources in. So you can choose to be a, uh, you know, a background where you're able to do magic. But if you do that, um, depending where you're putting your stats in terms of um, how viable that stat is, that would stop you from being a really good swordsman compared to somebody who did dump their, you know, their resources into your might stat. And so... There really is reasons to lean into any number of those or to just lean in a little somewhere and then somewhere else. Um, I'm really, the thing I am most happy with in this game is, is the balancing of how well uh, those options work based on those four stats. Yeah. Now, this brings me to the, con the concept of the flex die. Oh. Uh -huh. Which... I will, I will admit, when I first saw that, one of the first things that came to mind, even if it's not exactly the same, is things like the wild die in D6 or the dragon die in um, the age system. In fact, I'd say the latter is closer to is the closest to the mark. I, you can't see it, but I'm mm -hmm. doing massive finger quotes when I say closest. Um, 
<laughs> what prompt? I've never even played that game, so that's yeah. Um, the age system is what's used for like fan. Was started with Green Ronin's Dragon Age RPG, and then if evo- then was used oh, yeah. for stuff like the uh, Fantasy Age and the like, and mm-hmm. then event. Then years later, um, their adaptation of the Expanse, which I still have mm-hmm. not seen. <laughs> become a bit of a running joke oh, yeah. with of me saying I have not yet seen The Expanse. I will eventually. Yeah, I'm kind of part uh, of that joke too. <laughs> but when it but what was what was the process I guess when it came to developing something like the flex die? This one die that if it rolls its max something extra happens. So, uh, yeah, um, that actually came about, uh, the flexibility die, so I don't hurt anybody's feelings. I'm sorry, we get, I get a lot of, we got some pushback on some of my game terms, because I tried to, like, bake in some bodybuilding terms, because Conan is widely associated with bodybuilding, and I just wanted to kind of wink at that a little, but anyways, they beat me down with a stick and told me I couldn't, so flex means flexibility die, and in the sense that it gives you flexible options for what you can do with it. So, the reason I implemented that was actually during the um, first round of play testing when I was working on this with my friends, and we had a few people test it out online. Um, one of the criticisms was essentially that people don't like simple pass or fail resolutions like you, um, you, know, you either succeed or you don't. They want a little more of a, 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 a gradient there, right? Mm-hmm. And in other games... Um, I, and I agree with that with that concept to the point where I was like, yeah, you're right. But when I've seen it in other games where you have to like do little bits of math in between and it's like, okay, how much did I fail by? And then, oh, now I need a table to see what this does. I didn't want any of that, okay? I wanted everything about this. I was viciously opposed to adding a mental load where it did not need to be. So I wanted to go for elegance. And some will probably argue the flex die is an elegant, but I will argue that it is. So the flex die was essentially a way to, you know, you might pass or or fail a check, but you might pass big time. And it also allows you to sort of do a critical hit without having um, having to roll a particular die because you're dice can change, right? You might be rolling a d6 or a d8 or a d10 to do your attack, depending how you build your character up. So we needed something that would make for a big hit. Um, And I also needed something that would allow you to mitigate uh, shitty dice rolls and uh, failures uh, on the dice. And also the whole excitement of actually popping that number when it happens is just, it was such a hit at the table and with the people who've played it, um that it just felt right ultimately so we tampered with a bit in terms of what it could do and then we had to also kind of uh juxtapose it with our stamina system where you're essentially um like it can allow you to add to that stamina pool so even though we do have these kind of two subsystems everything else around it is so clean that i think it 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 really works rather rather well in that regard um so yeah, I mean, essentially the genesis of the flex die was just, I wanted to create a way that it wasn't just pass or fail, and that you could do some mitigation uh, to stop misses, or to also make attacks huge. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with, with how that's worked out. Um, and it's also another option, too, for your for your character build. You might be someone who ignores the flex die entirely. Sure, you roll it every time you leave it at a 10 Mm -hmm. so it's only going to be a one in 10 chance anytime you roll a die that you're going to get it still you are going to get it sometimes but if you're a character who's like man i want to lean into that because the flex die can be a game changer then you might build your character in such a way where you reduce that flex die which is probably the part that feels inelegant right you go from a d10 a d8 to a d6 when you're at a d6 you're a one in six chance of popping that flex, uh, you know, every time you roll a thing. So it's, it's another, it's another bit of progression that characters can chase if they want to go for that kind of finesse. Mm -hmm. Now, continuing on the whole thing with dice, I did want to kind of get a feel for the relationship between value and die when it comes to your core, um, attributes. Is it a case where certain values are going to be associated with certain die a la, 
ability score, ability scores and ability modifiers, or is there a different relationship? Um, well, in short, it's like if you have to make a check, right? You have to lift a lift a gate. You're gonna roll your. You're gonna take your might stat, which is static, hmm. and then you're going to take your might die, which is either going to be a d6, d8, or d10. Meaning you can, uh, you can basically your progression can be that your dice gets better. Okay, so it's a simple matter of there is a difficulty range to make this check determined by the GM. We have tables that guide and that sort of thing, but ultimately it's like you know what does the GM think it is for this. Um, and so you just roll the die and add it to it, um, which is simple enough. And if it's an attack, it's a little different because you're going to be going against an enemy's physical defense value. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, sorry. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Oh, uh, what the, what sort of, so given, given that, and I, I know you guys mm. don't want to go with with classes, but I'm also aware that whenever um, a game goes full freeform, that it can create the issue of analysis paralysis. Even even if you mm. have le- even if you have less options, the issue is still going to be there in some form. Mm-hmm. So instead of classes, are you go- are you going with um, with ar- with archetypes? Oh, just just broad just broad categories. Um, how are you ha- how are you handling that when it comes to character creation, so things don't get too overwhelming in terms of options? I've been talking we, too much, Shep. You want you want to jump in on that? Yeah, sure. We we've I mean we have um, yeah classes is certainly not the right way to talk about it. Archetypes is probably a more accurate term. We we use the term origins. The idea being that there are 10 origins in the core book and each of those origins provide you um, predominantly with flavor. The idea is that it's more about where you're from, what your upbringing was like, as opposed to the type of character you are, the class or the role that you take on. So examples of origins would be from the north, from the hills, um from a civilized land so you you're basically saying okay my character is like he grew up in a you know a, a tribal setting or he grew up in the frozen north but within that you can be anything you want to be so just because people from the, the north the bonus that's sort of intrinsic to them is that they're, they're pretty hardy that they um you know they, they they're naturally more robust to the elements and to a little bit of physical damage it doesn't mean you have to build that character as a fighter. You could build that person as somebody who's on a quest for, you know, for knowledge. They could be uh, somebody who's really good with their hands, somebody who's good at constructing things. You can build whatever you want. Or, Each origin. Yeah. Or if, sorry. Well, I mean, it's it's just an example too, right? Like where if you have an origin that sounds like you're a super tough guy, a barbarian, a fighter, but it gives you a plus to your grit... A plus to your grit might actually benefit you as a sorcerer because you are going to want some high grit because when you're casting spells, it's affecting your hit points and your uh, and those sorts of things too. So it's like, I think once fo- folks get a, a whole look at all of the character creation options, sure, analysis paralysis can come in, but I think also what it's going to be is more opportunity of like, ooh, I want to build this character. And, and this game does kind of lend itself to building a bunch of characters, playing them for a few sessions, retiring and moving on. Like you, you can go broad campaign with this. But this is also something that really lends itself to one shot, two shot, three shot, or just stringing together a series of those. Sorry, Shep, for interrupting. Yeah, no, those origins basically are, are 90% law and 10% rules. And the rules that they give you is each origin provides you a, a bonus that's applied and for some people that's like a an increase to stats or an increased or or to gain some starting skills for other origins that's a um a unique way a special way that they can spend a stamina point to do something so there's a there's a baked in rule for an origin they also determine the number of uh, life points that that character starts with as a basis before you add to that with the character creation process and it outlines 
what sorcery disciplines, if any, the character from that origin will have exposure to. And that's right. it from a rules perspective. Yeah, I can yeah, I can uh, certainly get that. So Yeah, I think that uh the well and the there there will be like a particular background that's going to say you can access all of those sorcery disciplines, right? Whereas most do not, right? Yeah. Some are going to be a few in one direction or the other. Yeah. And Sorry, go ahead. That's obviously going to be t tied to sk um, skills. So, mm -hmm. given now given that, oh, when it comes to... Since you since we hinted at sorcery, I I do want to touch on that. In the quick start, um, the primary sorcery that's showcased is white magic. Is it going to be yeah. a case where there's where um, sorcery is separated into different disciplines that, depending on origin, you'll have access to? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there are five disciplines that we have outlined in the core book. Mm -hmm. Um. And um, diff like five of the ten origins have access to one or more of those uh, those disciplines, and each discipline has a number of um, spells that 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 uh, discipline can choose to take on. They're treated like other skills. So every time a sorcerer chooses to learn a new sorcery skill, they are foregoing the option of learning a. Uh, you know, a physical skill that they can use to enhance their character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've done to make things um, more thematic to the books as well is not only include any kind of phrases of magic that have been talked about in How of Fiction, but we've also, each um, discipline comes with what we call um, inherent sorcery. So there are two or three uh, tricks, if you like, that a sorcerer can always perform at no cost to them, uh, mm. providing they have at least one skill from a chosen discipline. Mm. So, for example, if your chosen discipline is white magic, as you, you mentioned earlier, and you have at least one white magic um, sorcery skill, then you also have access to the white magic um, inherent um, skills as well which give you a little bit extra um, flavor and flair and things that you can do in a sort of more sort of characterful way. Uh, I'll give you an example of one. Um, if you, or white magic one is that uh, it's called sense sorcery. So you can basically, um, if something is happening near you that is of a, a magic nature, a demonic nature, um, then you can tell that it has a magical origin. Okay, like it's like mm -hmm. a built-in sense that you have. And each of those different disciplines come with a few of these kind of built-in um, traits as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I would... Uh, and those are... They are predominantly just like role-play um, inherent magic, but like... Yeah, absolutely. Th they are things that can actually determine you making checks, right? Like the GM might be, uh, like it, it can have a mechanical link as well. But I, I will also say this, um, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but like I wanted magic in this to be, like there has to be some work involved. You're not just a guy who spits out spells and is going to dominate. Um, I mean, when we look at sorcery in the Hyborian age, it's a lot about behind the scenes manipulation. It's not a ton of battle magic. So I, I, I would encourage sorcerers in this game to get imaginative and to really play up that role. There's a reason I linked, uh, essentially your wits stat is a combination of raw intelligence, computing power, and charisma, influence, that sort of thing, which that's part of your bag of tricks. If you are a character who's leaning into sorcery, you're going to have a high wit score. And with that means you can instill terror in people, you can manipulate them, you can cast your spells better, but, I, I mean, I... When you're adapting a theme, I, I have to be careful of, we have to really balance, does this game work, is it fun, um, is my character functional and viable at the table, but also does it fit that theme, right? 
Um, and in the quick start, there was a few a few people, uh, you know, kind of mentioned that white magic doesn't sound like Howard or that Jebel Sog is a demonic entity. And I'm like, I agree. I don't I don't know why um, that's an issue. I think it's because there's like a healing spell as part of that. But there's also spells that dig into the lore, like white magic and black magic are terms explicitly used by Robert E. Howard in the Conan stories. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it, but it really is. It's about, you got to balance theme and intention and feel with it being mechanically viable too. So yeah, the sorcery was a lot of fun to do. And, and my main, my main, uh, my rigid point with that was that no subsystem. I wanted it to function the same way as other skills. So uh, a warrior may have a charge skill where he can move and attack in the same turn uh, by just using a single action, but the sorcerer can cast a spell. It's the same sort of thing. It's it's not uh, it's not divorced from the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now. Continuing on, continuing on from the, from that. Uh, since you, since the the flex side was brought was brought up or was brought up earlier, as far as the mm -hmm. extra effect on that with within the full book, are you going to be providing examples on how on how that could be utilized in in roles that aren't necessarily tied to particular skills or effects or sorceries or whatnot? Yeah, we've got Meaning... we've um, we've put a little we, we've put some time and effort into making sure that um, most of the um, rules that are in the book are like in isolation. The flex die, the stamina points, the skills have a uh, one, two, or even three cited examples on their application. So there's a rule flex die. This is how you do it. These are the options. Here's some examples of it in play. Stamina points. Yeah. This is what they are. These are the options you can spend stamina points on. Here are some examples of how you use them in play. Mm -hmm. And following that approach with the core book has made it, you know, really a one of the more accessible core books that I've worked on. Um, yeah. You know, in all, all the time I've been involved in in RPGs, either as a writer or as a as a line manager, um, I, I, I feel like this book's going to be. Um, enjoyed a lot by people i'm really excited to get into people's hands and i do feel that, that level of accessibility through the examples um you know through through the way that we've we've explained these rules and made them as uh, you know quick to pick up and play as possible is going to be um hopefully very well received mm -hmm. yeah and what, what <laughs> one can certainly hope um and the the thing too with uh just to answer that question a little more explicitly where the flex die is pr is generally rolled for every roll you make, except for some very rare exceptions, to which, during those exceptions, we note them in the book. So we had one recently, someone brought up, and we were like, oh, yep, we need to specify that. So there's a few little kinks we're ironing out with that, but the, the general consensus is, if you're rolling a flex die for a check or an attack, you're just, you're always rolling it. Mm-hmm. And we didn't even talk about how stamina works, which is probably a something we should go over because um, so the reason stamina came into this, my main drive there was to emulate the feel of the board game. And in the board game, you have this freedom of kind of strengthening your moves, your attacks and, and that sort of thing where you can spend this uh, meta currency just, just to boost things. And so in this game, it is tied to your grit stat. So your grit stat is like your your constitution in, in other games. And so your your stamina pool equals whatever your grit stat is. So if you have a five grit, you have five stamina points that you can use in a session. Now, the way those work um, are, are essentially you can use them as you need them. Let me pull up this table here. Um, basically to, to boost things. So you can spend one to make an additional move action. So if you need to be more mobile, you can spend one. You can increase your attack or check results by plus one or plus two by spending plus one or plus two respectively, which then allows you to kind of mitigate any auto misses or something like that. Um, 
You can upgrade how much damage you do by just adding some D4s to it. You can increase the range value of a thrown weapon. You can ignore effects of encumbrance. Um, and you can, if you, you're on your last one, you can essentially spend it for like a heroic massive damage roll. Um, and so that stamina pool is going to be, I actually think this is, this is going to help analysis paralysis in the sense that I could, it could increase it in terms of how much should I spend, but we're, we, we are very much encouraging players to use those points because you use them or lose them, right? This game's broken up into tails, and at the end of each tail, which uh, it could be a few sessions to play, some are one shots, but then you you'll replenish at the end, right? Your life points and your stamina points, and then you go start a new adventure, you know, in the same way that Conan did in all of those short stories. Um, but the way we also have with that flex die, one of the things is no matter what happens with the flex die, if 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 you pop a flex and you don't have a use for it. Well, yes, you do, because you can always use it to store a stamina point. So the flex die helps replenish that pool. Um, and I mean, stamina points are those things that really make you say, uh, you know, if the GM says, oh, you didn't, then you say, yes, I did, because I'm heroic as shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, so, and so you spend those. Um, yeah, and I mean, that, that again, those, those two systems, which might seem, you know, metacurrency, some people might turn their nose up to it or, or something like that, but... I find that one of the things through testing that we really, really balanced and smoothed out were those those two things working together, and it's another thing that I'm I'm really happy with, and that feels right for for this game. Mm -hmm. Oh, and when when it comes to the whole meta currency debate, I've always I I find myself rolling my eyes at that at that debate more often than not because yeah. Uh, I don't know when this. I don't know when this happened, but I think some. I think some people forgot that they're still playing a game. Um, they're not uh -huh. invested acting. Yeah, and I'm. I, I'm. I will say this point blank: we have not written a simulator here. This is not a war game. This is a narrative-driven. Uh, I put up with a lot light of those simulators back in the '90s. I'm not going back. Well, exactly. So, so did I, and I'm not going back. And I think there's a lot of people who, you know, love sword and sorcery and Conan who want a game that does this as opposed to that. And that's not me saying that those other games aren't viable, man. Those games should exist for the people who want to play them. Yeah, I just, you should, to me, you shouldn't have to. Exactly. I wanted, I wanted something that would really fill this niche that I do not think we've had for Conan yet. Um, and even the Modifius game did the meta currency with like doom and momentum. The difference there, and I think that was cool. I, I, I liked the idea of that. Um, but then you, you can get into a little bit of an antagonism, right? Between the GM and the players, which not everyone's going to jive with. Um, so this one, this one is very player focused in terms of, um, you're going to feel like an ass kicker and that's on purpose, but and you're going to, even with the minion system, you're going to be just chopping dudes down until you don't. Until something steps in your way, it kind of tells you who's boss in terms of like, you know, you imagine Kosatral Kel or Bail Pator or Thog tearing a piece of Conan's scalp out. Like, they're going to get beat down at a certain point. But, man, th there's a power fantasy involved in this kind of stuff, and the players should feel that um, when they're playing. And We've also put in a lot of tools where the GM can easily uh, spike up the difficulty as needed, um, just even built into the stats. We have a range on certain things that are like, you know, make this more or make this less. Um, and so, yeah, and I think the trade-off there is that if, if the players are feeling empowered and they're really whooping ass, that's great. But the GM isn't liking that probably as much if they have all of these things to track and all this other mental load that's going on at the same time. So it's like, it's easy to run this game, especially if you've ever played an RPG. Um, so that's my hope is like, I'm not saying this is beer and pretzels, but I want this to be something that brains don't have to be in deep analysis mode the whole time and you can just have a good time playing it. Yeah. Now, what would you guys be shooting for as far as a page count? That's a Shep question. I can't even remember. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, um, we're we're in a really good place with development and layout of these books. So we are at a point where we're pretty much complete. 
uh, writing and content for these books with the exception of stuff that we'd like to put in with a few stretch goals and mostly that's adventure content um we're pretty much done and we're into the layout phase so our core book uh with the exception of any you know tweaks um that we decide along the path is is nailed down and um the core book you know let's say there's going to be a little flexibility but we're looking at uh it's a sub sub 250 page core book so we're looking at probably 230 to 40 pages in final print um and around half of that is uh rules related content and half of that is lore and world building yeah the and, and the, the encyclopedia stuff in this the the Hyborian Age vibe is done by Jason Dural, who did a lot of work for the Modiphius game. Um, and he even wrote the, the Conan Bible for Heroic Signatures, the rights owners. Um, and I mean, we, we, as we were talking about how, what kind of game are we doing, how big is this, my first thing was it needs to actually be small. The offering needs to be quaint, because at least at the beginning, because the Modiphius game was massive. It was like... You know, 20 books sold uh, seven years before they released. Um, and that was that was straight up a problem. Um, and, and, you know, those were the early days of Kickstarter. I'm not throwing shade. It's just like, we, we know people, uh, Conan RPG players, already have shelves heaped with Conan RPG books. And so we wanted to add something smaller to that pool to say, look, give this a try. See if it, if it hits what you, you want it to. And if it's not the game for you and you want something robust and chunky, then that's great. What you will have is a beautiful art book. You will have uh, exceptional lore. I mean, the Modiphius game got a lot of high praise for its lore, and rightfully so. What we've done is basically take, without too much extrapolation, almost none in terms of, well, here's what we think this means for the Stygians. It's just what we know presented in a sort of flavor texty way that I think would be a joy to read for any Howard fan. And I'm not sure where else we have something like that in a succinct package. So just as far as the offering, the rules are, are pretty simple to get through. There's definitely a lot more meat on the bones than what you're going to see in the quick start. Um, not in terms of like a ton of different sub rules, but just more fleshed out things, more options than that. Um, but the other offerings will be basically adventure books. And within those is like, here's an adventure you can run in an evening. Here's an adventure that'll probably take three. Here's a campaign that will take, you know, perhaps multiple sessions to do. Um, and within those, I mean, even if you don't want to run pre-gens, they're packed with um, enemy profiles and things like that you won't find in the core because they're specific to those adventures so really there would be a reason to pick up all three books but you also don't have to you could just get the core book and you're good to go and that was that was something i i really put my foot down on was i don't want anything that's going to overwhelm folks because they have already chipped in a lot for conan rpgs over the year that said we we, we also have a wicked launching point where we already know the sort of systems and things that we want to develop further uh, for, our, you know, as long as we're nice and successful, um, we'll keep going. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth um, just adding to that. You, Matt just mentioned in, it, in his closing comments there, he mentioned the three books. And I don't think that at this point we've officially um, said exactly what the initial yeah. offering will look like and so I, I think like this is as good, good a time as any to do it um so alongside that sort of 230 40 page uh core book we'll we also have what is called tales of the hyborian age volume one and tales of the hyborian age volume two which are a collection of uh tales of various lengths from uh, guest writers well-renowned RPG adventure writers and some very well-versed Conan um, fans. And um, they're really awesome. Like, there's some phenomenal we content clips. in those books. Yeah, I mean, if you are a, Modifius, a fan of the Modifius system, three of the most, uh, like, the heaviest writers in there, we have 
working on our book as well because you know that's the uh, like <laughs> we don't we want people who know know the world and know the characters right so that's that's who we got we had jason Dural in there we've got um jason brick richard august is back and i mean these guys are total veterans so um, yeah we've also got uh, adventures written for us by uh murray takuda and Dave Semok, who's done a lot of the work, just won an any for his work on uh, the Aliens RPG for Free League. Mm -hmm. um, and our GM screen, so we, we basically have a core book, two adventure books, and the GM screen is effectively our, our initial offering. And the GM screen comes with uh, what we're calling the Games Master's Companion, which is a uh, sort of 30 or so page booklet that is a, like, drum up an adventure of your own drum up your own tale in an instant you know like random tables and huge resource lists of places and people and antagonists and plot twists and rewards and artifacts and just loads of really useful tricks for gms and that's all been put together for us by uh, by john hulahan who um you know well-known writer he's worked on uh, actor Cthulhu and he's a, he's a well-known fiction writer huge Conan fan written lots of uh Lovecraftian fiction of his own which is you know published uh, throughout the world and um you know we've got some really great names and great writers working on these products and we're really excited to be going to Kickstarter with three books in the GM screen that are basically 99.9% .9 complete that's really yeah. exciting for us to be like, you know, if we unlock some stretch goals and we get the capacity to add some page count and get a few more adventures written, like all we have to produce is the stuff that we unlock during that campaign. Aside from that, we are going to Kickstarter with a complete print ready product. And that's a really exciting place to be. Mm -hmm. And, and somewhat, uh, respond like, Anyways, there's a responsibility now, right? There's a lot going on in Kickstarter and trust is eroding, or not just Kickstarter, but crowdfunding in general. Um, and I've said this before, I work for Monolith, um, well, because I love the work, but also I just know that Fred Henry takes that stuff very seriously. And th there's been times where we have hit pause on a certain thing because he had to ensure um you know funds are ready for this last like no robbing peter to pay paul bullshit um people are going to get what they ask for here because for me i have my own reputation at this point and i would not hitch a wagon to something that is bound to fall and so as as shep says like the fact that this is coming out ready to go like it's like for almost all of it um that's just encouraging and it will mean that the product will you know, it won't take a long time. It'll be like all willing a year and then boom, it's in folks' hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly, I can certainly get that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness around here. Yeah, I didn't know I was supposed well, to be drinking. I would have been. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I am. As far as you know, oh um, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, no, it's been a it's a pleasure as always. I mean, yeah. I thank you so much for asking us to yeah. to come in and, and chat with you. We we really appreciate it. And of course, a sincere yeah, and... thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar. Of do you want us? Do, oh. do you want a scoop? Shoot. Like October fifteenth, guys. October fifteenth is the is the launch date uh, for this on Kickstarter. So be sure to get on over to Kickstarter. Check out one of the links on our socials um, and like sign up. Get your notification. Let's get those numbers up. Let's get the hype rolling. But unless anything crazy happens, October fifteenth is where we are looking to uh, unleash this beast. Yeah, that is a scoop. We have, we have, right, that hasn't so been announced yet. So <laughs> this is, this is the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> but the, as, as I often, as I often say, there'll be plenty more where that came from on the open bar of the internet. But until then, 
On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.